Welcome to another episode of the Project Reinvented podcast and I'm your host Lachlan John McRae. Now today we are in for a treat, a master of laughter, resilience and wisdom. He was a writer for The Tonight Show for 20 years. He holds a record for the longest non-stop comedy club road trip ever, working with some of the all-time greats, Jerry Seinfeld, Adam Sandler, Ellen DeGeneres, to name a few. He's not just a comedian. He's the mental health comedian. He's a true beacon of hope and inspiration. He's also the author of the compelling series Guts, Grit and the Grind. Frank King is a TED Talk veteran with 11 talks under his belt. He also currently helps others to get on that TEDx stage. Frank doesn't just crack jokes, he's cracked the stigma around mental health and he shows us how humour can be a powerful force for change. Let's welcome Frank King. The man who's not only made us laugh, but he's profoundly impacted the mental health conversation. So without further ado, let's talk to Frank. Okay, welcome Frank to the Project Reinvented podcast. And, you know, thanks very much for taking time out to come and talk to us here today. Well, you know, I must tell the folks who are listening or watching, it wasn't my choice. It was part of a plea bargain. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, you know, Frank, you know, I've watched a bit of your stuff and it's it's amazing. And, you know, some of the things that popped out to me was your authenticity and your vulnerability to share your own life experience, which I think is, is hugely important to raise the awareness of suicide, you know. And, and you mentioned something which, you know, blew my mind. It was you had an itch to scratch that only could be scratched by the nickel-plated 38 and suicide is always on the menu. Yeah. You know, can, can you talk to us about that? You know, the experience that you had yourself and, you know, what that means to you is suicide is always on the menu. Uh, yes, because they are two, because there are two separate things, actually. The, the um, itch on the roof of my mouth I could only scratch with the front side on my nickel plate at 38 happened in 2010. After we filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy and lost everything, we worked for my wife and I for 25 years. And that's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like. Uh, spoiler alert, I did not pull the trigger. And if you want to know why not, it's in my first TEDx talk called A Matter of Laugh or Death. Uh, the other is I have two mental illnesses, major depressive disorder and chronic suicidal ideation. And major depressive disorder is relatively common. Chronic suicidal ideation is not. That means for me and people in my tribe, the option of suicide is always on the menu as a solution for problems large and small. And when I say small, my car broke down a couple of years ago. I had three thoughts unbidden. One, get it fixed. Two, buy a new one. Three, I can just kill myself. That's chronic suicidal ideation. The upside of that is when I tell that story, oftentimes, most of the time, there's somebody in the audience who has that. They don't know it has a name. They think they're just some kind of freak and completely alone. A young woman came up after a college presentation and said, thanks for the keynote. I said, you're welcome. She goes, but I got to tell you, it made me weep. How did it make you weep? Well, you know, you talk about your car, get it fixed, buy a new one, kill yourself. I said, yes. She goes, I've been having those thoughts all my life. I thought it was just me. I didn't know it had a name. I thought I was some kind of freak and completely alone. And when I heard you say you have that, I realized, First time in my life, I'm not alone, and I wept. Yeah, that that is amazing, Frank. Because see, when you I listen to you say it, I've had that thought, you know, and it wasn't even that long ago. You know, I, I struggled with substance abuse and, and alcohol for many years, and on more than one occasion, I've thought about killing myself. And I've had the belt round my neck, and you said in one Ooh, of your talks as well. Yeah, so, and and you you said that you know that they they don't want to die; they just don't they just want to remove the pain, and that's exactly what it was for me. I was desperate to remove the pain. I didn't want to leave my family, but the pain was so you know intense that I didn't know how to deal with it. And when I heard you speak about that, and you know, I think not enough people are talking about this. You know, and 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 not just that, but even about must have been about six weeks ago, I was having difficulties, and I had that thought. Maybe it was just better if I wasn't here. That would be easier. You know, and 
so it's like why are people so scared to talk about this or so scared to come out and discuss it well again two separate questions uh <laughs> scared to come out and talk about it there is a stigma attached to mental illness and a separate and distinct stigma attached to thoughts of suicide which i think keeps a lot of people from speaking about it and if you speak about it in the united states depending on the state to a therapist then the therapist is bound by law to have you taken in front of a judge and decide whether you're going to get a three-day 72-hour hold involuntarily in a mental facility so that's uh, people who are not suicidal i think don't talk about it because if they're talking to someone who they think is suicidal they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing or they don't know what to say so i think that's why it remains i wish we could speak about it out loud those of us who have those thoughts i believe we could save lives if we weren't worried about the three-day involuntary hold in a facility with no shoestrings or, or belt so yeah and that that blows my mind it really does because in this day and age where the i i still feel there is a stigma even though you know gone are the days where big boys don't cry and you know you you're not a man if you show your emotions you know i think those days hopefully are gone but i still think there's a bit of that lingering about because you know recently i was i'm always doing research on this and you know it says that the the suicide rates in men you know is is, is consistently increasing and the single single biggest killer in men under the age of forty five is suicide, but yet there's a there's far more women are diagnosed with depression and attempted suicide. So and that that baffles me. It's like more women are diagnosed with depression and suicide, yet more males are taking their life. So there's obviously still some type of block here or some type of dissonance to. You know what men are thinking. You know, well, they're not so much what they're thinking, but the the fear of coming forward. You know, especially if you're a middle aged man, because for me, I'm a middle aged man, and that fear of you know failing and looking looking like a yeah looking like I'm weak is still there. I still feel that, and even though I know it's not, it's it doesn't matter. I'm. I'm a human with emotions, with feelings, but yet I still feel that. What's well, your and I do believe the big boys don't cry slash male um, toxicity is still around. And the proof being that in the United States, roughly eight out of 10 people who die by suicide are men, generally middle-aged men. And, and that's why the two co-authors and I put together a series of four books on men's mental health. It's stories of men, by men, for other men. It talks yeah. about what their problem is, how that happened, or how they're coping. We're hoping another man will pick it up, see how another guy's coping with it, and think, I can do that. Uh, yeah, masculine, masculine toxicity. Uh, and yeah. oddly, three times as many women attempt suicide as men. However, Men tend to complete because they use a firearm. And as you well know, here in the United States, uh, there are more firearms than there are people. So it's very easy to get your hands on a, a firearm. Yeah, and because we don't have firearms. We have them here, but they're not as readily available as they are yeah. in, you know, in the U.S. Now, you know, have you seen a change, say, in the past you know, 10 years, you know, with the, you know, the health or the, the government or the governing bodies, you know, actively trying to, to, you know, make a difference, try to, you know, go out there and, and help people? Not here in the U.S. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, because the gun lobby is very wealthy. It supports a goodly number of politicians. So the idea of, sensible gun legislation it it 
it never makes it out of committee. It never gets a vote. It, it's probably not going to happen. Until recently, they did not allow the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, to study gun violence as, as a health and safety issue. Just recently, they finally passed legislation that the Center for Disease Control can study that and share their findings. You know, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's true. And the, and by the way, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, they separate the opioid deaths from the suicide deaths. Because with opioids, you never know, unless there's a note, whether they died by suicide or just overdosed. And, and by the way, things are getting better in some ways. More people are talking about suicide out loud, more men. However, when I started, did my first TEDx talk in the United States, 39,000 people a year died by suicide. In 2022, a little over 49,000 died by suicide, another 10,000 per wow. year. So it's not getting better. In some ways, it's getting worse. And so, you know, and you've obviously been doing this for a, a long time. You know, what would be, you know, if you were in charge, you know, and you were talking to, you know, the regular Joe like myself, what, what, what would you advise? you know, the families to do, you know, people who, you know, just regular families, what warning signs, what could you ask them to, to look out for, you know, in just regular cases, you know, what kind of traits or behaviors mm. or, or that would you look at? And this is what I talk about in my keynote. My job is to empower the audience to save a life because the good news is, here's some good news. Eight out of 10 people who are suicidal are ambivalent. They cannot make up their mind. And nine out of 10 give hints in the last week leading up to an attempt, which means you can make a difference. You can save a life and you can do it by doing something as simple as we're doing here. And that is starting a conversation, if you know how. And then I tell the audience, okay, signs of depression, not an exhaustive list, but my top three. A person eats too much or can't eat, sleeps too much or can't sleep. They have trouble getting out of bed in the morning, so often late for work or school, but rally in the afternoon like a different person. And here's one you can observe visually. Uh, they let their personal hygiene go. Normally, they're pretty well put together. Hair, clean, clothes clean. To this day, the hair's a little dirtier. The clothes aren't quite so clean. It may be because they're having trouble getting out of bed in the morning to run a load of wash and take a shower. The question comes up, what do you say to somebody who's depressed? Well, here's what you don't say. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Turn that frown upside down. My personal favorite, have you tried fish oil? At which point I go from suicidal to homicidal. What you do say is, I'm here for you and I mean it. I know you're not lazy or crazy or self-absorbed. I know that mental uh, depression is a mental illness. But here's the good news. With time and treatment, things will get better. I will take the time to help you get the treatment. And here's the difficult question to ask at this point, are you having thoughts of suicide? Just like that. There's no wives tale that should never mention the word suicide in front of somebody who's depressed. And I love the reasoning because it might give them the idea. Suicide, what a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Trust me, it crossed my mind. So let's say they don't admit they're having thoughts of suicide, but your gut tells you, and I say, go with your intuition that they're circling the drain. How would you know? Well, they talk about death and dying. You catch them Googling death, dying, or how to die by suicide. Death and dying may appear as a theme in their artwork or their music or their writing. Here's a counterintuitive, oh, here's a counterintuitive one, very dangerous. They've been depressed for a long time. Now they're happy for no apparent reason. They may be happy because they've chosen time, place, and method, and they know the pain is coming to an end. And here's another one you can observe very easily. They're getting their affairs in order, especially if they're giving away prized possessions because they want to make sure those possessions go to the people they want them to go to when they're gone. So then what if they tell you they are having thoughts of suicide? What do you say? You say, do you have a plan? And if the plan is detailed, time, place, and method, you need to get them as quickly as possible to a mental health facility simply for evaluation. Find out what's going on. People ask me, what would you do? I said, I would, I would get into a mental health facility and see exactly what, is it garden variety depression? Is it 
the depression or depressive state of bipolar. And I would also recommend a physical, have a full physical. Sometimes physical ailments present as mental health issues. And now the question comes up, what to do if they have a plan for suicide, but it's not particularly detailed. I've never read this or learn this in any class I've taken on suicide prevention, a psychiatrist and I came up with this. So let's say they've got a plan, but it's not really detailed. What would you say? I would say, okay, tell me, are you gonna kill yourself? And if they say no, I would say, okay, tell me why not. Make them give voice to whatever's keeping them here. Okay, something is keeping them here, otherwise you wouldn't be having this conversation. It could be family, friends, religion, pets, who knows, whatever it is, that way you can leverage that to help keep them safe for another day. Wow, that's that's great advice there. And you know, because I know this the stigma is still around, but you mentioned something as well uh, in one of your talks, and it was the generational and depressive disorder. Is that what it was? Where this can actually be generational from, you know, your family? Because I know what you've went through. We we haven't spoke about it, but. In your f family history, there's been suicide. You know, there's been your aunt and your, I think it was your grandmother. That's my grandmother, my great aunt. My grandmother died by suicide. My mother found her. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her. I was four years old and I screamed for days. And the thing about being hardwired for depression and suicide, generational depression and suicide, if you're that close to an actual suicide, and when you hear the story of my TED talk, you'll know nobody could get any closer, then the chance of you seriously considering taking your life later in life go up, and that's what happened in 2010. So, yeah, the joke I have is there are more nuts in my family than in a squirrel turd. <laughs> so and, that's one of yeah. the reasons. I, one of the reasons I speak on it is because people say, you know, can you be cured? Uh, no. It's in my DNA. It's just as much in my DNA as comedy is. Almost all my family is funny. And almost all my family is crazy. So it's, yeah, it's just, uh, but I've learned to live with it. I used to say that I fight depression, but that's, that's a misnomer. You can't fight it because you can't win. Fighting implies you're going to win. I can tie and stay alive or, or lose and die by suicide. So, and I know my cycle. It's important that people learn their cycle. Mine's 72 hours. And I know when I start cycling down, like somebody's turned up the force of gravity, I know 72 hours later, roughly, it'll be cycling back up and I'll be fine. The problem for young people is they haven't been through that cycle as many times as I have. And in the, in the downside, cycling down depression, people tend to think in the immediate, you know, if it's never going to be any better than this, and I don't think it is, then why bother? So, I mean, I've been through it so many times that I, I know exactly, I just ride the wave you know go with the energy rather than trying to spend a lot of energy fighting it so what, what do you mean by the cycle is that you know you identify thoughts feelings you know behaviors what do you mean by that you know the cycle of going down most people have a a finite length cycle for their depression i mean there are people who are chronically depressed and they're depressed i suppose consistently and a lot of neurotypical people think that if you are living with depression, it's 24-7, 365. That's not necessarily the case. With a self-care plan, including a diet, exercise, good night, sleep, medication, meditation, I have more good days than bad. However, I do know my cycle. And a friend of mine who was, had lived with bipolar for decades, bipolar disorder, said, Frank, I know you're not going to believe this, but there are triggers. So next time you begin a cycle down, look back and see if there's a common element that precedes your cycle. And sure enough, I found a couple things that will send me into a tailspin. One of them is disappointing my wife. You know, being mad at me is one thing, but disappointed says to me, you could have done better. I expected better. And man, that will send me into a tailspin in no time. Uh, and, and, and here's the upside of letting your relatives, friends, family, anybody you trust know. When I say, are you mad? And she knows, you know, that, that the word disappointment triggers me. She'll go, no, honey, I'm not mad. I'm disappointed. <laughs> so we can actually joke about it. 
Yeah. But yeah, there's just generally people have a cycle, X number of days, hopefully not weeks or months. And generally there's a trigger or two that can, you know, it can happen without a trigger, but there are triggers that can, you know, actively make it happen. So it's about having that awareness then, you know, of your thoughts, your behaviors, what's going on around you. And I could link that much to like when I was in active addiction, I'd be trying to get sober, something would trigger me and it would take me on that downward spiral. And as I became more aware of my triggers, I could, you know, not walk past a certain shop or go a different route home so I wasn't passing the liquor store. So I could avoid these, you know, controllable triggers. But, uh, and that just comes down to, you know, being aware and looking back and studying your actions, your behaviors, yeah. you know, how you feel and everything like that. You know, that that's 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 great. And you know, you what you you spoke about your your health, your fitness, meditation because for me personally, these are the same things that keep me sober. My exercise, you know, making sure I'm looking after my my health, phys- what I eat. But meditation and journaling has been probably the most profound thing that I've ever done in my life to keep me aware of my thoughts you know, and my actions as well. So when you identified, or you've probably always known, you've, well, you have always known that you've had these, how long have you been meditating for, for example? Uh, since the mid, early 1990s, a friend of mine gave me something called the catnapper. At the time, it was on a cassette tape, then a CD. Now MP3, it's a 29-minute guided meditation. Takes you down, brings you back up, recharge. It's like, remember, remember when computers in the 90s, if it wasn't working and you called customer, you know, called customer service, well, try unplugging it, plugging it back in. That's kind of, and I, when I speak, when you speak, you want to, you want to teach them something, learning objectives. When they hear Frank speak, they'll learn how to. And then you want to leave them with the next logical step which is after they've heard Frank speak, they'll be able to. So I encourage them, everybody, neurotypical, neurodiverse, whatever, to have a self-care plan. And I talk about mine and it's diet. I'm on the keto diet, the intermittent fasting, exercise. I'm actually a, a master's, master's bodybuilder, over 60 bodybuilder. So I'm in the gym every day. So diet, exercise, good night's sleep. People, people discount a good night's sleep. You know, I, I, it always scares me when somebody goes, I can get by on three hours sleep a night. Oh, not for long, you can't. Uh, diet, exercise, good night's sleep. Meditation, the cat nap twice a day after a meal. And uh, medication. I didn't take any medication until I was 60. I took an over-the-counter supplement called SAM-E, SAM-E. You can buy it here in the States at Costco. It's, it's really good on two things, three things. It's good for your liver. It's good for your joints. And it's good on mild depression. When I turned 60, my wife said, look, just go to the doctor, ask him for, you know, some antidepressants. So I went in and saw my doctor. I said, I want some antidepressants. He said, why? I said, because I can tell you what the barrel of my gun tastes like. He could not write that prescription fast enough. (laughs) And you know what? Two weeks in, my wife noticed a change in my personality. I didn't, but she didn't say anything. She wanted to see if I noticed. Three weeks, it hit me. I had this thought for the first time since I was 18. I like my life just bubbled up out of nowhere. Now, bear in mind, I've got a good life. Been married 37 years, wonderful pets, nice little house, doing the thing, you know, for a career that I love, but still living with depression. And and the medication, just a small amount of one, and mine happened to work. That medication worked right away, which is not always the case. Here's something your listeners or viewers should know. About a third of medications, psychotropics, work really well for people. About a third, people think, eh, it's not bad. And the other third, it sucks. So if you are on a medication and it's not working, there's a DNA cheek swab test. You send your DNA to one of half a dozen labs, and I don't know if they're all over the world, but they're half a dozen in the U.S., and they will do their best to match your DNA to a psychotropic medication that works best with your metabolism. So it cuts down on the experimentation. You know, go on, then work, paper off. Go on, then work, paper off. And the, what I tell the audience is that 
can you spot the theme, the through line in my self-care plan? The through line is those are all things I can control. I learned long ago, only try to control the things you can control, whether it's business or life or mental illness. As you know, the rest of it's above my pay grade. I can't do anything about the about politics, about the pandemic. I can only control. So those are all things I can control. And by the way, you mentioned journaling. One of my clients, one of my TEDx coaching clients, he has something called the five pillars of recovery from mental health, uh, mental well, uh, mental illness. And one of them is one non-negotiable item in your self-care plan. And my mine is working out. Now, I achieve that in a number of ways. There's something called gamification. You make a game of it. For example, if I'm having trouble getting out of bed in the morning, not physically, but mentally, I'll make a, a physical to-do list, you know, pencil and paper to-do list, half a dozen things. And the game is, once I scratch off number six, Lachlan, I don't care if it's three in the afternoon and broad daylight, I can go back to bed and do what I've been wanting to do all day long, pull the covers over my head, you know, and watch the the next episode of Jack Ryan on Netflix or Prime or wherever it is. So it's called gamification. And I do that with the gym. The gym is 25 minutes away. Yeah, the, the hardest thing about the gym is getting there. I mean, I got a car. I get there no problem physically. So the deal is, if I get to the gym all dressed out, I can go in if I want to, do one repetition of one exercise, turn around and go home. Now, I've never done that. I was in there about 90 minutes, but the option's there if I'm not feeling it. So that's gamification. The last thing I tell them is I believe, Lachlan, you should have a schedule. During the pandemic, they asked a guy who'd been in the space station almost a year by himself, except when they brought groceries up, how in the world do you survive that social isolation? He said one word, schedule. I go to bed same time, get up same time. I eat at the same time, I meditate at the same time, I binge watch Netflix at the same time, I work out at the same time. I believe you should have a schedule. You should figure out what your circadian circadian rhythms, you know, when you should be sleeping yep. are and stick to it. And turns out, and I fought this for years, Lock. I'm a comedian. How could I be a morning person? How, how, how? Turns out, guess what? I am. I mean, radically morning. I go to bed between six and seven at night and I get Get up between two and three, because this time of day right now, here in the U.S., where it is 6.33 in the morning, I might smack in the middle of my most productive time of day. By five o'clock in the afternoon, I don't want to talk to anybody. I try not to skip anything after five o'clock because, I, you know, I'll be grumpy. So the self-care plan, gamification, schedule would be my advice. And, oh, listen, during the pandemic, uh, more than one person called me because they were concerned because, you know, I have mental illness. And how was I how was I surviving the pandemic? Here's the thing. I have a self-care plan. Had one going in, had one coming out. But my stock answer was, look, this pandemic, I've had two aortic valve replacements, a double bypass, a heart attack, three stents. I live with two mental illnesses and I lost to a puppet on the original star search. This is not the worst thing that's ever happened to me. It's keeping the humor, though. It's, and and that's, you know, I just look at, at you, Frank, and I, I I watched your shows. You're a comedian. You wrote for the, the, the Tonight Show for 20 years. You have all these accomplishments, and, you know, your humor is so, you know, bright and breezy. But then you look behind that, and there's obviously been a lot of pain for you throughout that whole time. And if you can rise above it, with what you're telling people to do with your care plan, with your schedule, with structure, then, you know, anybody can do it. And it's about taking the right action is what, what you're saying there. Because for me, what you're saying is, is pretty much identical to how I stay sober. You know, it's the same thing. I go to bed about 7, 8, I'm up at 4 o'clock. I have a, a pretty much identical, you know, sleep, wake up, and my, my productiveness in the morning is my best. But that's because I have a plan that's in place. And a minute ago, you, you spoke about your life. What you do is, you know, you love your career, you know. Now, how did that come about? Now, I know how it came about, but I want my, 
my listeners to understand how you went from, you know, a regular job to to comedy, you know, and to becoming this mental health advocate, you know, because I think it's it's great because you spoke about that plus the the entrepreneurs, but it all ties into the one thing. Yes. And I did a TEDx talk, my fourth one. It was called Suicide, the Secret of My Success, Dead Man Talking. By the way, they like the title and subtitle so much that the TEDx folks didn't make me audition. They said, no, man, you're on. So what happened, Lachlan, was I was after college. Uh, I actually told my first joke in the fourth grade at age nine. Uh, the kids laughed. The teacher was hysterical. She had to go to the teacher's lounge. She was laughing so hard. 12th grade, last year of public school in the U.S., they had a talent show. Nobody had ever done stand-up. I did, and I won. Of course, I beat the folk dancers and the accordion player. Not a tough not a tough win. And then I was going to go to L.A. My mom said, no, you're going to college first. I don't care what you do when you get done. You can be a goat herder for all I care. But you're going to be a goat herder with a college degree. So I went to college, got a couple of degrees, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and then went to work for an insurance company. They transferred me to San Diego. And in San Diego, just by chance, there's a branch of the world famous comedy store, the one up on Sunset in LA. And so picture this, this is, the, I'll tell you, this is how the TEDx starts. What would you do if you knew for a fact that you had absolutely nothing to lose? What audacious goal would you go after if you knew for a fact that by not pursuing that goal, you would literally die. That's where I was in January of 1984. I was married and miserable, fine young woman. We just didn't belong together. Well, you know what they say, we had nothing in common, but you know what they say, opposites attract. She was pregnant, I wasn't. Wonderful woman. And in fact, she was not pregnant. I just made up that joke. I was selling insurance, which is a great business, but just not for me. I, was, I hated every minute of it. And I was driving down Highway 163 in the rain one day in January, about five o'clock in the afternoon, which is where my biorhythm bottom out. And the thought crossed my mind because I'm miserable. Why don't you just kill yourself? My second thought was very empowering, which was, well, I could divorce my wife, quit my job, try comedy. If it works, and I think it will, great. If it doesn't, hell, I can always kill myself. So I got separated from my wife. I, I kept working in insurance because I needed, needed an income while I was doing open mic nights. But I went to my first open mic night on April 1st, April Fool's Day, 84. Lachlan, halfway through my set, inside my head, a little voice said this, you're home. I knew that's where I belong. And 18 months later, I said to my girlfriend, now my wife, 37 years, I am going on the road to be a stand-up comedian. Do you want to come along for the ride? Thinking she'd say, Lachlan, oh, hell no. She goes, yeah. So we gave up the apartment, um, gave up our jobs, jumped in the car, and we were on the road together. She just came along for the ride for 2,629 nights in a row, nonstop, seven years and change. Wow. Comedy club to comedy club to comedy club. Uh, I worked with Seinfeld and Dennis Miller and Steve Harvey and Rosie and Ellen, Adam Sandler, Kevin James, back when they were just comp. Dr. Young, Dr. Ken, uh, Retta from the uh, from NBC's uh, Bad Girls or Good Girls and I think Community Center or one of those. Anyway, um, so in the mid-90s, I got a chance to do radio. So I did radio for about a year and a half. And like most people in radio, there are two kinds of people in radio, Lachlan. People who have been fired, people who are going to be fired. <laughs> Got fired and realized the comedy club scene was dying. But my act was very clean. So I could do corporate comedy, what they call in the U.S. the rubber chicken circuit, because they always <laughs> serve rubber chicken, you know, chewy chicken at the yeah. conferences. So I did that until 2000, through 2007. 2007. I had 96 engagements doing corporate comedy. I made over $200,000 telling jokes. And then the recession hit. In 2008, business dropped off 80%. By 2010, I'd extended, I burned every line of credit I had, and that's when we filed bankruptcy. That's when I came close to killing myself. The reason I was going to kill myself was <clears throat> the bankruptcy was just devastated my wife. 
And I thought, I've got a million dollar life insurance policy. I can fix this. Because in, in suicidality, there's something called burdensomeness. You feel like you're a burden on your family, on your friends, on the world. The world would be better off without you. And I thought, well, she'll be broken hearted, but she won't be broke. Problem blocking was I had sold insurance, life insurance. I knew there's something in every life insurance policy called an incontestability clause, which includes a suicide clause. And in most policies, you have to wait at least two years, pay at least two years before you die by suicide or it pays nothing. So I called my agent, found out I'd only paid for it for 22 months. Fortunately, because if it had been 24 months or better, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I thought, well, I got, I got, I got to wait 60 days to kill myself. I can do that. I wasn't marking days off the calendar. Can't remember when day 61 came. Um, things got better a bit. Bankruptcy went through, phone calls stopped. So I'm still here. But when I came out that other side of that, you know, I'd always, since I began doing comedy, I wanted to make a, make a living at comedy and Lachlan, more importantly, make a difference. But I could never figure out how to do that. And a friend of mine named Judy Carter, who's a comedian and speaker, wrote a book called The Message of You. The Message of You. If you listen to this and you want to be a keynote speaker, The Message of You by Judy Carter. The subtitle is fabulous. Turn your life into a money-making speaking career. Judy sent me a copy. Frank, read it. You'll figure it out. I, I went into it locked and thinking I got nothing. And halfway through, she was, she was absolutely right. I thought, well, wait a minute. Given my family history, my mental health history, my close brush with suicide, I could keynote on suicide prevention if I got some training and certifications, which I have. Now, second hurdle, Lachlan, I've been doing stand-up for two and a half decades at this point. Who is going to believe that I could do anything serious? That's when I applied for my first TEDx talk. And it was on suicide prevention. It's all about starting the conversation because what I realized as I was preparing for it, even though hardly anybody talks about it, if you bring it up, almost everybody has a story. So my clients will tell me when I go to work, keynote for them, we just brought you in here to start the conversation on suicide. When I do a keynote, I do a general Q&A at the end. But before I start that, I say to the audience, look, we're going to do some Q&A. If you have a question you want to ask or a story you want to share and you don't want to do it in front of everybody, I always allow an extra 30, 40, 45 minutes afterwards to do that. And there's always a line, sometimes just two people, sometimes 10. And, and most of their stories start like this. I've never told anybody this. <laughs> and I say, hmm, I get that a lot. <laughs> what I've done by getting on stage and being vulnerable, especially a man, is I've given them permission to give voice to their feelings and experiences surrounding depression. And I mean, probably the most dramatic incident, I was speaking on a construction site. Because construction in the U.S. has the highest rate of suicide. A thousand people die by accident in construction every year. Get this, 5,000 die by suicide. You're five times more likely to jump off the building than fall. So the last guy in line was a young black man, probably mid-20s. He's crying in front of all his you know workmates and i waited for him to gather himself and i said what's up he said well i haven't slept for two nights i work on the fifth floor and i think about jumping off the building every day i said why is that he said because i've lost three people close to me in the last year to violence and one was my daughter who died in my arms that's the kind of thing that happens if you open the conversation the, the human resources guy happened to be standing there. I said, look, you need to take this nice young man by the hand to a mental health facility immediately for evaluation because he's circling the drain. A couple of months later, I called back fearing what I might hear. And the meeting planner said, no, Frank, he got, he got evaluated, medicated. He's back on the job. So wow. that's the difference. My goal is to save a life a day. And, and by the way, your listeners and viewers should know, I didn't, nobody knew I was depressed and suicidal officially. They might have guessed it occasionally, but until I did that TEDx talk, I came out of the mental health closet on that TEDx talk. When my wife's about to play the YouTube video, I said, stop. I need to tell you some things you don't know about me that you're going to hear on that video. So I recommend that it, 
if you are living with a mental illness, I would share that with anybody you know, like, and trust. Because it's kind of like racing NASCAR. You need a pit crew. And in NASCAR, you don't start looking to hire a pit crew when the car rolls into the pit. You need to have them there and ready to go. Uh, by the way, that's the theme of those four books. Uh, they're called Guts, Grit, and the Grind and Mental Mechanics Manual. And it's, it's written like an automobile owner's manual. You figure that way guys might pick it up. And full of automobile metaphors like the pit crew. Uh, you know, when you buy Chai a car, you get AAA or similar because you know at some point the tire is going to go flat or the battery is going to go dead. That's kind of how that's kind of how with mental illness you need to be you need to prepare ahead and you need to prepare the people around you ahead. So that's how I got from comedy to to from a funny speaker. Judy Carter would say in the message of you from a funny speaker to a speaker who is funny. And you know yeah. what the difference is between the two? Lachlan? Go for that. About $7,500 plus travel. <laughs> I, On the I plus can't side. Think of my comedian, comedian friends to jump ship and do corporate. Yeah. And that just for anyone that's listening, I'm going to put Frank's links in the description for his TED Talks and his book. The book's a four part series. I actually tried to get it before we were going live, but because I'm in the UK, I couldn't even get it on Kindle. I couldn't, I would, I had to order it. So I couldn't get it before we discussed to have a chat about it, but I'll put it in the the description because it, it's a four series part. So it's guts, grit and the grind. That's right. And then the TED Talks as well. Now, just, you know, see when you're speaking ab about this, the, now, does this drain you emotionally when you're talking about it, when you're, you're talking to people who are going through this, you know, how do you prioritize your, your own mental health when you're actively engaging in the prevention of suicide for others, you know, try to help other people? It does drain my energy a bit. People ask me, does it trigger you to tell your story over and over? Uh, no, because. Remember, I talked about that line of people. It's very therapeutic that perhaps I'm helping, helping, you know, uh, improve a life or save a life. It's one of the reasons I tell the audience, remember we talked about, you're not going to kill yourself. Tell me why not. Every now and then somebody will ask me that question after a speech. Are you going to kill yourself, Frank? No. Tell me why not. Well, one of the reasons is, is that line of people. I feel sort of like, you know, the character George Bailey and it's a wonderful life. Yeah. The angel shows him what all those people's lives would be like if he weren't, if he weren't simply there. And I feel like I've been shown what these people's lives would be like, the ones lined up, what their lives would be like if I weren't there to reassure them, to, to listen to their story, to share a word of advice. And if I kill myself, then in theory, I could take a lot of those people with me. And you know what? I got that idea from a friend whose dad was in recovery from alcoholism for 20 years. Somebody asked him at about the 18 year mark, are you ever going to drink again? <clears throat> and he said, no. And they said, how do you know that? And he said, because of all the people I have, what's it called? Sponsored. Sponsored. Yeah. And all the people I'm going to sponsor. If I dive back into that bottle, I would take a lot of them with, me, and I can't. And that's, that is powerful. That is powerful because that's when you're, you're leaning into service because I, I believe what you're doing is, is amazing because there's nobody else out there that I've seen, the, the, the mental health comedian, you know, when people look at that, they have to take a second glance because they're like, <laughs> what is this? And then you hear your, your sense of humor, which is quite dry and some of the things, and it's amazing, you know, and, and I think it's, you've obviously found your purpose because you're helping thousands of people directly and indirectly because, you know, even by me coming across you, you know, I feel more confident in speaking about it because I've done some videos on Facebook about it and, and spoke about it, but I've never really spoke deeply about my own, you know, cases of trying to kill myself. You know, I've I've not went that deep and I've touched on it briefly, but now it's a case of, you know, if I want to be of service to others, then I have to be vulnerable and let them see that I'm get, I'm opening up so that you can then open up to me or anyone else, because at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about 
me trying to help other people. So I'm removing the focus from me and placing it on service to serve others. And well, and that's you notice, a guy named, I would encourage you to do that. There's a guy named Donald Miller who wrote a book and my, my veterinarian read the book and he summarized it for me. He said, Frank, you need to make whoever you're talking to the hero in the piece. He goes, as a veterinarian, when people come in and say, you saved my dog's life. He says, no, I, you brought the dog in. That saved the dog's life. I just did my part. So you notice when I talked about speaking to an audience, I said to them, you can make a difference. You can save a life. I'm not there to save lives. I'm there to empower them and you, Lachlan, to, uh, to, to save a life. And that's, I, I believe that's, that's the formula. Empower others to, you know, make them the hero in the piece. Yeah, and, and I totally agree because that's the whole reason of, of this podcast. It's called Project Reinvented because my mission is to help a million people reinvent their lives. And whether that's through helping them with addiction, with mental health, with just physical health, what, whatever it is, because I've got, a, I'm specialized in each of these areas. And, you know, and when you, you spoke about the, the entrepreneur part uh, in one of your videos, you said about a third of them, will, they will be doing what they're doing because they had no other choice. Like you said, well, I'll either that or I'll kill myself. And I was like, that, yep. this is why I'm doing the podcast. And, and I only realized that when I listened to what you said, because I was so unhappy at doing what I was doing. It was like the universe was doing everything against me and forcing me into this place where I had to actually go for what I wanted. Otherwise, I didn't want to live. I didn't because I was so miserable. Yeah. And 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 I took yeah. the jump. And see, since I've took the jump, it was like this cloud has been lifted from me. And it's like, I don't have to, you know, I've got no pressure on me, nothing. It's just now I'm getting an opportunity to do what I want to do because I've removed the pressure or the weight from trying to fit expectations of other people, of society, of this, that, and the next thing. And I've just allowed myself to go for what I truly want. And so it was it was amazing to hear the stuff that you had said and I could identify with it so much of it. So anyone that's listening, I will put the links for Frank's TED Talks in here. And there's a lot of them. I think it's 11, Frank. <laughs> I think you're the world's record yeah. TED Talk holder and you've got another one coming. Uh, yes, uh, 12 coming up. And by the way, uh, the TEDx folks do not like the fact that anybody has more than four talks. Uh, I found that out when I did my fifth one, which sadly, because it never went up on YouTube and I couldn't get any video, just stills, sadly, because it's the only one I've ever gotten a standing ovation for. And it is my favorite to this day. It's called Mental Health and the Orgasm, Treat Your Depression Single-Handedly. Yeah, I, that, that's that's because I did hear you speak about that one and you got uh, immediately you got okayed for that. But so, because I couldn't find all of them. I could only find, a, like, I think it was about four yeah, or five you, of them. You, you won't. Yeah. They, and that's they, it. They, I, I mean, they won't put them up anymore. Well, everyone that I find, I will link here because they were so helpful to me. Plus, I'll put a link to the book and I'll put the link to Judy's book because I found that link in a different podcast you'd done with a lady who was, you was talking about uh, some type of uh, kind of, event that she was doing i can't remember where it was but it was a lovely woman you were speaking to her and you were talking about suicide because and i know i'm conscious of, of time frank is there anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to touch on you would like to talk about before we finish up here today yes i want to give the tedx people a hard time because you know lachlan they will tell you it's not about the speaker or the person it's always about the idea well, it seems to me they're, they're taking it out on me personally because you've seen my TEDx talks. Just yeah. think those other 11, I'm sorry, those other, what, four, seven would undoubtedly save and or change lives. And they refuse to put them up, which grinds my gears. But, you know, it's their business, their job. Um, the, I put my cell phone number, by the way, up every time I speak on the screen. Yeah. And I say, look, if you're having a having thoughts of suicide, call the suicide hotline or text it. Having a bad day, call a crazy person. Here's my cell. <laughs> and about once every two weeks, somebody will call with a question about themselves or a loved one or, you know, just 
just to share, you know, a moment and a story. Um, I think the, like to leave people with, eight out of 10 people who are suicidal are ambivalent, nine out of 10 give hints in the last week leading up to the attempt, which means you can make a difference, you can save a life, and you can do it by doing something as simple as we're doing right here, and that is start the conversation. And now, thanks to Lachlan and myself, you know how. <laughs> yes. And where can people find you, Frank? You know, because I, I check. protection. <laughs> yeah, because I, I clicked on, because I know you, you train TEDx speakers, and I want to be a TEDx speaker, so I actually looked to click on your link. But one of the links that I got wasn't working, so I just wanted to double check that I've got the correct links for you. Well, it's not working because TEDx busted me for copyright and trademark infringement. Maybe take it down. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> if if you want to, if you want if you're curious about my suicidal prevention speaking, it's mentalhealthcomedian dot com. Mentalhealthcomedian dot com. If you're curious about making money speaking and doing a TEDx, it's how to make money speaking dot com. And by the way, Lachlan, I was trying to after TEDx busted me and said you can't use TEDx coach anymore, whatever what. I'm trying to think of a URL. And my wife goes, Well, try how to make money speaking dot com. And you know, I'm thinking, Lachlan, that has got to be gone decades ago. Yeah. I typed in GoDaddy, how to make money speaking dot com. It came up available. I could not believe it. So all of my, you know, TEDx coaching curriculum and my make money speaking curriculum are there. That's how people can get in touch with you for that. Perfect. Because that's the thing. You're not just, you know, this advocate for mental health. You're also a coach who helps people speak and make money from speaking like you do. And that's and, actually and one of the service. Yeah. And that, that's my biggest dream is to, I say it every morning because I believe choice is we all have choice. So every morning I make choices. And I put them down, write them on P paper. And one of them is I choose to be a speaker, speaking on the biggest stages, making the biggest impact throughout the world. And I believe one day that will be me. But well, listen, you should be. Lachlan, yes. you should be speaking. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, again, because, because vulnerability, as Brene Brown says, is a superpower. And a man being vulnerable is like a super superpower. <laughs> so you need to be up there. Yeah. Listen, Frank, I totally appreciate your time, you know, and I will support you in any way I can. And I'm pretty sure the listeners here will be doing the same because you've shared some, you know, invaluable information. And if anyone is looking for further information, you know, I will put my contact details there. Frank, will, I'll have Frank's there. And I'm always happy to help. I always put my, my contact details. If anyone wants to reach out and have a personal conversation, just let me know. I'm always, I will always make myself available. And so, and that's it, Frank. We'll leave it there, and and hopefully we can do this again at some point. Thanks very much for your time. And let me let me close out the podcast as a comedian would. Let's go for it. Are you ready? Yeah. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe, and tell your friends. <laughs> if you did not enjoy this podcast, well, we hope you have no friends. Legendary, legendary. I just want to close with a big massive thank you. See, Project Reinvented has never been about me. It's always been about you, the listener who's looking to improve their life. So with that, I just want to express my sincere gratitude to each and every one of you for not only listening, but your continued support. Project Reinvented wouldn't exist without your presence, so thank you. My goal is to make this as personal to you as possible. So your feedback is invaluable to me, always welcomed and always appreciated. So as we go on this journey together, remember, the art of reinvention doesn't always demand big massive leaps. See, big change starts with small steps. So think about this, what's one small action you can take today that will reignite your journey of life reinvention? Make that decision to take that step. See, life's a canvas, reinvention's the art, and you're the artist. So start creating. See you next week.